friends, Elisa Childers here. We are going to get philosophical and theological today. We're going to talk with a special guest about why he thinks it's so important for every Christian to understand classical theism. We're going to talk to Dr. Brian Huffling in just a moment. Well, I'm so excited for today's podcast, not only because of who my guest is, but because of the topic we will be discussing. One of the reasons I'm so thrilled to have Dr. Brian Huffling on today is because when I was having a bit of a crisis of faith, I began auditing classes at Southern Evangelical Seminary. I've talked about this before on the podcast and in my blog. And for several of the classes that I took, uh, Dr. Huffling was my professor. So much of what I initially learned about theology and apologetics came from him. So it's really an honor to get to talk to him on the podcast today. So Brian has three master's degrees in apologetics, philosophy, and biblical studies, a PhD in the philosophy of religion. This is all from Southern Evangelical Seminary, or SES. He's currently the director of the PhD program and assistant professor of philosophy and theology at SES. So there is no one more qualified to talk about this meaty theological topic that we're going to tackle today. He has a brand new website that you want to check out. It's brianhuffling.com, where he blogs about all the stuff we're going to talk about. About today. So if you find that you're interested to learn more in these topics, definitely check out his blog. So Brian, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, we have a lot to get into, and I want to set this up in a way that will be accessible to Christians who may not have given a lot of thought to the idea of classical theism before, may, they may not even know what that means. So let's, uh, before we even and get to the definition of that, let's first talk a little bit about philosophy. I have found that in Christian circles, that word can be a bit misunderstood. I think I misunderstood that word before I started studying. I somehow saw philosophy as an enemy of faith or as something that's, you know, secular, and we, we shouldn't right. be thinking that way as Christians. So why don't you start by telling us what philosophy is and what role does it play when it comes to theology, which is basically what we think about God? Okay. Well, the word philosophy just literally means love of wisdom. If you think of the word Philadelphia, Philadelphia means the city of, of brotherly love, love meaning coming from the word like philosopher in, in Philadelphia. And historically, philosophers have just wanted to try to figure out what is the nature of reality, what is the ultimate aspect of reality. Uh, some older philosophers have tried to figure out what is that one philosophical current that binds all of reality together. And so that's kind of historically where, where it's come from. Uh, more so in the Middle Ages and even today, philosophy has, be, has become known as the handmaiden to theology, where theology is the queen of the sciences. And really, philosophy is just applying our reason to whatever field we're studying. So you could be, say, a philosopher of religion like, like myself, who asks questions like, what is, does God exist? What is he like? What are miracles? Do they happen? Uh, what's the relationship between faith and reason? Or we can do philosophy of math, for example. It says, what is the nature of math? What's the nature of a number? Or a philosophy of history. What, what is history? What does it study? And what is the nature of that? So philosophy wants to get at the nature of things. And so when it comes to theology, core theology of the study of God, we try to get to uh, things like what is the nature of God? And does he exist? What's he like? How does my reason, that I might, just my common sense, my, my ability to, to rationally think through things and make arguments apply to my faith? Uh, can we give uh, philosophical arguments for God's existence and for the coherency of the concept of God and that kind of thing? And so when we talk about philosophy and religion, as you've already stated, many people have wrongly thought that Philosophy is a pagan notion, but really the ability to reason, that is just to think through things and demonstrate things through logic, is, the, is, is what sets humans apart from other beings, other animals. And so this is actually how God has made us different. And so rather than seeing it as a pagan issue, it's one where we can actually worship God. 
And the Bible tells us to love God with our minds, and that means to to think about Him, try to be more like Him, and that means to to not just think about Him or believe in Him blindly, but to use our minds to think about what it means for God to be, how we can be more like Him, think about how He relates to us in different ways, how we can share Him, and those kind of things. Uh, so philosophers have tried to figure out, you know, like, is, is God in time? Is God change? What is God like? And the Bible is not a collection of systematic theology chapters. It's a series of of books written to individuals and churches and different groups. But it's not technically a theology book. It contains theology, but it's not a, a theology book. Like you'd get going to a seminary theology class, for example, or a Bible college class. And so when we talk about these, these issues, that Romans 1 says we can know about God through what has been made. We know about the invisible attributes of God by what is visible. And so this is how we can apply philosophy to God, by, by reasoning to see what is God like, uh, how does he relate to me, how do I answer questions like if God is good, what does evil happen, how does God relate to time and change and, and all these kind of things. So in Colossians, uh, Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. So I think a lot of Christians read that verse and, and think, well, even Paul is saying philosophy is a bad thing. Right. So how, how would you answer that? Okay, a couple things there. One, Paul, along with other people, say not only to be aware of philosophy, but to be aware of bad theology. But no one takes from that, you shouldn't do theology, they always say do theology properly or do it well. And so we I agree with Paul, I think hopefully obviously, that we shouldn't be captive we shouldn't be taken captive by bad philosophy. But as C.S. Lewis says, we need to do good philosophy if for no other reason bad philosophy needs to be answered. And some commentators think that Paul actually is talking about a specific philosophy, like possibly Gnosticism or something like that. And so Paul is not saying not to do philosophy. He's the same person who wrote Romans, who said in Romans chapter 1, we can know God, not only that he exists, which is implied in what he's saying, but that we can know about his divine nature and eternal power, eternal power and divine nature, uh, through what has been made. And that is a, a rational philosophical move. And so Paul's not saying don't do philosophy, period. He's saying don't do bad philosophy, do good philosophy. Like, like he says in many places, to, to beware of being taken captive by bad theology. In other words, do theology well. And, and obviously, for Paul to reason through to even say that, he's actually having to use a little bit of philosophy, isn't he? It, exactly. You can't say not to use reason without using reason. Mm -hmm. And again, this is how God made us. He made us different because we have the ability to, to use reason uh, and to worship him in that way and to be more like him in that way. So we should never put down reason as you mentioned, it's, it's self-defeating, but it also is the way in which we're different from other beings and we're more like God than other animals in that, in that regard. Well, one of your passions is defending classical theism. So why don't you explain what classical theism is? Okay. Well, theism is just the belief in a, a God almost synonymous with monotheism, which says that there's one God who exists as the creator and sustainer of the universe. And classical theism is basically synonymous with historical or traditional theism. And this is uh, also seen in Judaism and Islam. Uh, th that is these notions of God having certain characteristics or attributes. So classical theism maintains things like God is simple as he does not have parts, he's not kind of put together by theological or immaterial Legos, so to speak. He does not change. He's not in time. That is, he's eternal. He's not, he's not sequential in time like, like you and I are. And it really wants to maintain the, the infinity and the transcendence of God. A lot of times today we want to make God more down to our level in the image of man, as it were. And we forget about that God is other and he's transcendent. And so classical theism wants to maintain the historical positions that the church has held to in the writings of, say, for example, Augustine, Anselm, Thomas Aquinas, uh, and those kind of guys that have, have laid down a, a traditional line of thinking that's been orthodox or the mainline views of God. And so 
anything that's not classical is going to depart from those those major theological attributes in some way or another. Well, your mentor, Dr. Geisler, uh, said something really interesting. He said that there are only two views of God, classical theism and process theology. And I was really right. interested when I saw that because I come across process theology quite a bit in my study of progressive Christianity. And uh, that's something that a lot of progressives are affirming and, and they're really into. So let's talk a little bit about process theology. What, what is process theology and how is it the opposite of classical theism? Okay, well, process theology, the bottom line there is God is in a process. Now, there are thinkers like um, Charles Hart Shorn and uh, Alfred North Whitehead who make a kind of an a, a extreme or radical view of this, and that is that, that God has an active pole and a passive pole. The active pole is that God exists in some way as he is now, and the passive pole is becoming actualized in some sense by God. And in this sense, God is somewhat, in, in their views, in, in some weird way, part of the universe, and he's progressing and learning and becoming. Uh, so this, this notion of God becoming or changing is in stark contrast to classical theism, where God doesn't become anything because he's perfect and infinite, and he doesn't change, not in time to change. Uh, rather, he just always is his one unified state of pure existence, as opposed to the hard, extreme folks like Whitehead and Hartshorn, who say that God has these two poles. And then I have a little bit softer version of that, although logically it's not very different, and that's open theism, which says that God doesn't know the future. He's kind of learning and growing along with us. He's in the kind of relationship that requires him not to know what we're going to do to safeguard our free will. And he's, in a, and to use their language, taking risks by making us. He doesn't force us to do things. He allows us to, to go along with him or not. And he's going to discover what we're going to do and kind of be reactive. The classical theism holds that God is not reactive. He's purely active. Uh, he doesn't have even the, the ability to change because that would require another additional um, theological or metaphysical Lego, as it were, that is to be put together in parts. That requires one part to become something that it wasn't before. Well, if you don't, if you say God has no parts, even in, in the sense of these uh, real abstract theological or, or metaphysical notions, then He just is what He is all the time, and that's just that's actually the definition of eternity that's been adopted traditionally by a, a theologian called Boethius. And he taught that God, rather than you and I who lose our life during the course of our life, I, don't, I lost yesterday, that's gone to me. God, does, God doesn't lose his life. He enjoys all of his life all at once simultaneously and never loses any of it. And so that's in stark contrast to the open theism or process theology. But I think that Dr. Geiser is right because either God is changing or he's not. There's no middle ground. You just like being pregnant. You can't be kind of pregnant. You're either pregnant or not. Mm -hmm. Well, God either changing or he's not. And so either we're going to be a classical theist or we're going to be a process theologian in the sense that we believe that God is simple, unchanging, eternal, or that he's not simple. He does change and is in the course of time. Okay, so you mentioned God is simple. And I remember the first time I heard this thinking, what? God's not simple. What is he talking about? So <laughs> this is a doctrine called divine simplicity. And uh, you've actually, on your blog, you call this the most important and most controversial divine attribute. So let's get right. into divine simplicity. Tell us what it, what it is and um, why it's so important. Okay. Well, the doctrine of divine simplicity... Contrary to us, name is anything but simple to understand. It's very complicated, but I do think it's the most foundational. And in the writing of many of the of the, our church fathers and leaders, it's one of the foundational doctrines uh, from which all the others are derived. So, if we can think of ourselves, we we, we have different kind of parts. Right? We have bodily parts. We have immaterial parts, like the soul, for example, or the mind. So we have an immaterial and a material part. 
But for things that have parts, they have to be put together. Okay, so my six-year-old Alex loves Legos, as do I. He has a lot of my Legos from when I was a kid. Well, Legos don't put themselves together. Legos require a, an intelligent being to put themselves together. Well, if these kind of metaphysical or philosophical parts are put together, like existence and the ability to change, otherwise known as act and potency, act is being in the state of existence or state of actuality as opposed to potentiality, which you can become something else. If God's purely act, then he doesn't have the potential to become anything, so he can't change. So the notion of simplicity denies any kind of parts to God because saying that God has parts is just saying that God has to be put together by something else. In other words, God, if he's composed of parts, requires a composer to put those parts together. But then we're calling into question God's, what's called God's aseity, which is the notion that God exists of himself and doesn't require anything beyond himself to exist. But if he's composed and requires a composer, then he really isn't even God, because he requires something else to put him together in a sense. And then it's the most debated. It hasn't been the most debated very long. I mean, it's been accepted almost universally from Augustine down to the, the modern times. Um, but it's been debated, it's been rejected, and as William and Craig has said recently, it's, it's, it's fallen hard times today, and it's, it's oftentimes and most times, especially in Protestant circles, rejected. Uh, but I think it's the most important because it sets a person on the path to either being a classical theist or being a process theist. Because if you accept simplicity, then you implicitly and then later explicitly have to accept that if he doesn't have parts, he can't change, and then he can't be in time, and he can't be affected. But if you say, no, he does not have parts, now he can be changed, he can be in time, he can be affected. And so our, our view of simplicity takes us on one of these two very different courses. So this is sort of the foundation of, of classical theism, it seems like. And so when we're, when we're reading in the Bible about God having, you know, his eyes are looking or his face is turned towards you, or it talks about him in, uh, with words like having physical body parts, uh, how, how should we read that, that kind of, those kind of scriptures? Well, we read them as figures of speech, because if we know that God is, is not a physical being, then he's an, he is an immaterial being. But immaterial beings, unless, they, unless God were to become man through a theophany, that is, God just takes on and manifests as a physical being, but God in himself, if he's immaterial, as both reason and I think the Bible suggests, like John 4, 24 says, then we know that that places in Scripture that seem to contradict the literal truth of God being immaterial have to be taken as a figure of speech in some way. So, for example, uh, when it says that God's going to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah to see what's going on, it's not that he's, quote-unquote, not there or doesn't know. This is a way for us as humans to kind of understand God because he puts his—he his, uh, talks to us in human terms— and so we hear him saying things like, I'm going to go down, I'm going to see what's going on, or talks about his uh, having physical bodily parts like eyes and, and nostrils and feet and hands, and take those as, as figures of speech. Otherwise, we say God is limited, God is put together or created, um, and those kind of things, which many Christians are, many may not be an overstatement, but a lot of Christians today are more than we'd like to see, are actually adopting this idea that, that God is physical, lives on a planet, these, these kind of things. So you can see yes, how— That's how, a Mormon belief too, isn't it? It's Mormon, but it's also word of faith, word of faith theology. Right. Uh, people like you know, Copeland, Jesse Duplantis, they think they'll teach that God uh, has a physical body, not in a manifestation, not in a theophany, not in the person or the nature of Christ as a human, but God in his divine essence. But then we have to ask, okay, well, if the universe, if God is physical— then how did he get those parts put together? Where did he exist before the universe, quote-unquote, exists as a different dimension? It just raises all kinds of problems, uh, theologically and, and philosophically. And if anyone's listening and they think, well, you know, surely they're not teaching that. How do you know that? I mean, you actually came out of the Word of Faith movement, movement didn't you? I did. I was, I was 
a follower of Copeland, Jesse Duplantis. I got to meet him and his wife. Um, and I've read many of their books. I've listened to them a, a lot, uh, studied their theology. And you're right, it, it's, it's, some of them are more careful and some of them are more uh, unguarded in what they say. And they're very explicit about God. God being physical, things like faith being physical, and, and it just gets even weirder yeah. <laughs> the more he talks about it. But yeah, but, but rejecting these kind of classical doctrines and rejecting reason, because one of the things in, in Mormonism and the word faith, and they're very similar, is a, a rejection of using reason for our faith. And, and they say instead of using reason, we need to rather rely on God speaking to us, but there's no real checks and balances of knowing how God would speak to us emotionally or whatever language they want to use. So we're rejecting objective reason, again, is a one step closer to this kind of subjectivism that they want to advocate, because you can't, you can objectively verify or falsify a rational claim, which you can't, you can't tell somebody that God didn't tell them something. There's no way to unfalsify, you know, falsify that. You mentioned act and potency. And for, for many people, this, this is going to be a new concept. Is there some sort of like an illustration you can give us as to what you mean by act, potency, and how God is what we're calling pure act? Yeah. So if your listeners are interested in, in learning more about this and at the same time learning more how to deal with theism and philosophy, especially in the context of, of how to refute atheism, then I would uh, recommend a book called The Last Superstition by Ed Fazer. One of my favorites. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's a great book. I think I probably, uh, I'm not sure if it was your class. Oh, yeah. It was uh, assigned reading was for one of the classes I took with you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the examples that's very easy that he gives is a, a rubber ball, right? So we can think of the rubber ball being in a state, being in a state of actuality or existence. And so when I say something is an act or actuality, all I mean by that is it's in a state of being real or a state of actual existence. But the ball can change, right? So we can throw it from one place to another. We can smush it. We can melt it. We can run over with a car. We can paint a different color. A, a dog could chew it up. And so the ability for that change to happen is called its potency or potentiality. So if the ball did not have potency or potentiality, by definition, it wouldn't have the potential or the ability or power to change or become something, right? So having a potency is having the ability or power, it comes from the Latin word potens for power. If someone has the potential to do something, they have the power to do it, uh, to change. So if, if, if a ball didn't have an existing ball in act, didn't have potential to change, then by definition it couldn't change. But we know things like rubber balls have the potential to, to change, to be smooshed, colored, all that kind of thing. So the act is just the state of existence, and the potential or potentiality is just the ability or possibility for it to become something that is, that's not yet, but that it has inherent in its nature to become. So uh, jello does not have in its nature the power to become a house or a skyscraper, but metal does because of its nature. It has certain powers or, or possibilities. So when I first learned about this, like I said, it sounded like an insult, like God has no potential and he's simple, you know, but it really helped correct, I think, a deeply held view of God that I had because I think I saw him as like this wise old grandfather in the sky with glasses and a, a long beard, kind of like a, like a Gandalf figure <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so when, when we start to think about God as pure act, he's, he, there's no potential for change in him. He is pure being. And uh, it, it sort of shatters that um, overly humanized idea that we have of him. And yeah. You know, maybe maybe tell us a little bit about. Obviously, Jesus called God Father. We're we're to relate to God as a father, but how do those things go together? Seeing God with no potentiality, seeing his, him as a simple being, but still viewing him as Father. 
Well, he, he has a potential in the sense there's a distinction between active and passive potential. So he has the ability to act and to create. And so just so we're clear on that, he does not have the potential to be changed as a passive potentiality where he, where he is affected. As a pure, uh, being a pure act of pure existence, he does have the ability to exercise his power on something else like creating the universe. So he does have that. Now, when it comes to uh, things like us thinking about God as, as being our father or being our God, uh, these don't in any way hamper our view of God being pure act or uh, being pure existence. His being our father is a relationship that we have in an analogous way. We think of we, we talk about God all the time as, as being X, Y, and Z, like like our our people in our world are X, Y, and Z too. Plus. So we think of there are aspects in our in our world where things are protective, like God is a fortress, so he's our protector in a sense. We talk about those kind of metaphorical uh, terms. God being our father. God's not a father in the sense of a paternal father, literally, where he where he he and another being together uh, create a procreated being. He's our father by an analogy, by being our our protector, uh, the person that we should emulate, and 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 scripturally the person and and being that we understand to be the creator and sustainer of our existence. And there's nothing in, in this kind of discussion or relationship that we have with him as father and, and creation or creator and, and, and creation uh, that would in any way endanger simplicity. So what are some other attributes of God that are essential to classical theism? Well, one that follows directly from simplicity is the notion that God does not change because a change happens when a being already in existence becomes something that it was not previously. So if God does not have a potential to become something, then he, by definition, cannot change. Okay, so that's just known as divine immutability. A mutation is a change. Then he, if he can't change, he's immutable or immovable. Well, a second corollary from that a logical step from that is if change is the has been the traditional uh, description of time, that time is the measurement of change, right? So we think of the Earth going around the sun, and one revolution it takes a, a solar year for us. Um, there's no such thing as a year in itself, right? Uh, a year is just the measurement between the relationship between the Earth and the Sun of its starting and stopping point in a revolution. So if time is the measurement of change and God does not change, then God is not measured by time, then he's not temporal. So then what is he? He's atemporal, or in the classical sense, he's eternal. Another way of thinking of that is that God, again, enjoys all of his life all at once and doesn't lose any of it like you and I do. So if simplicity is true, then immutability is true, and then eternality is true. If all that's true, and God, again, doesn't change, and he's not in time, then it means that we cannot affect God. We don't, we, don't, we don't bring about a change in God, because he's not reactive, he's purely active. And so we don't literally make God angry or upset. Let's make it back to your question before, but well, how the Bible says God gets jealous, he gets angry. Well, the Bible uses figurative language like God being a wall or having a physical body. Uh, but he's, he's, him being jealous or angry is a way that we understand and can talk about him analogously to say that God, in terms of being a jealous being, is, is he's like a jealous being and that he does not want us to go after other quote-unquote gods or false gods. He wants, us, he wants our attention. He's true God. And he would get angry at our sin because he, he brings about effects like an angry person does. He brings about judgment and righteousness and justice, uh, and in some cases destruction like an angry person does. And so we see these, these ways of talking in Scripture that's analogous, uh, not untrue, but not completely literal either. And so we, we get these ideas, if simplicity is true, then he does not change. He's not in time like you and I are. Uh, he's impassable, meaning he's not affected by us. 
He also is infinite in that he has no limitations. Uh, if he's infinite and he has knowledge, as we think he does, then he knows everything. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He can do all things that can be done. He's omnipresent. He's, he exists everywhere. And, of course, there's different ways of, of explaining what these terms mean, but those are the, the general ideas of, of what, what they mean. So let's talk about his goodness. When we say God is good, what are we talking about? <laughs> okay. Well, it depends on, on the context of what, how that word is used. So a lot of people will say God is good, and they may mean something differently than somebody else does. So he's definitely good in the sense of metaphysically good, because traditionally to, to exist— is a good thing because God is good and he exists. Therefore, in any way to be like God is a good thing. And to exist is to be like God in some way, at least in the, the limited way. Therefore, to exist is to be good. And so there's no there's no way in which a, a being can be purely evil because insofar as a being exists, to that extent, that being is like God. And to that extent, he's good. And so metaphysically, we say that God is good in terms of saying that he's, he's being and, and, and being itself is good. Now, that's one way people can talk about being good. Other ways people talk about being good are ways like you're saying you and I are good. Um, oftentimes they mean morally good, like, like you, you are a good person if you, if you exhibit good character or if you live up to the, the moral standard that, that God has given us as humans to live up to. Um, and of course, I think you know this, that my, my view is that God is, is not a moral being because of just what he is. He transcends moral categories. We as humans are moral because he's made us with a, a certain nature. So a human murdering another human is an evil, but God can't even do it. He can't murder a human being. He, he, he's the author of all life, and it's not wrong for him to take it. And we could discuss that morally can if you want, but that's, that's one way in which people think God can be good. We describe God good morally in, again, in analogous terms, like God is just, because he, after he's created us, he gives us what we deserve, and he gives us what we need to actualize our own goodness. So really, whenever the Bible is describing God in our language, it's, it's all analogous, isn't it? Yes. Because we can't fully comprehend who he is, because he is so other than us. Right. And so... I can know to an extent what you are because you're a human and I have experience of what a human. So I can, I can say, I know what a listener is like because she's a human and I have all these myriad experience, experiences of myself and other humans. But we don't, have an, 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 we don't have a material, empirical way of knowing God. As, pa, as Paul says in Romans 1, we know God through what's been made, through nature, apart from God just giving us some kind of supernatural revelation, which he normally doesn't do. And the way that we know things is through our, our, our bodily senses. We don't sense God, and so we don't know what his nature is. And he's infinite. So we, have, we don't know what infinite being is because we're finite. So we have a, a built-in limiter, if we can put it in that regard. And so when I say Alyssa is good or my cheeseburger is good or my car is good, the notion of goodness is contracted to what I'm referring to. So to be a good car is different than to be a good shoe, which is different than what it means to be a good hamburger or a good person. And so there's an, there's an analogous sense of goodness in all those examples because to be a good X is to be a good member of that classification or quote-unquote species X. We all know what it means to be a good shoe. You know, It's in good repair. It's comfortable. It protects your feet, that kind of thing. Well, it means to be a good human, right? Because we have examples. Um, when it comes to God, we say God is good. We have some notion of good, goodness with God. But we don't really have a definition because we don't know what God's nature is. Because as you mentioned, he's, he's other, he's transcendent, he's infinite, and we just don't sense him. We have to, apart from knowing things directly, we know God indirectly through creation, as Paul says in Romans 1. So what about more personal experiences of 
uh, God's presence, of the supernatural, the manifest presence of God. Uh, I would even say that I've had um, a couple of supernatural experiences. So what role does things like miracles and signs and wonders, how does that play into what we're talking about here? Uh, I'm not denying that God can manifest himself supernaturally. We see it in the Old Testament, we see it in the New Testament. I'm not denying God can do it. I'm saying as, as a normal course of action, God does not normally uh, reveal himself or have some kind of supernatural manifestation. Even in the biblical times, it wasn't common for God to do a miracle or even show up supernaturally. You take all the miracles in the Bible, I think I've heard it said, or not heard it said, that it'd be over the uh, roughly 1,500-year period the Bible was written, and be abruptly one miracle every eight years. But when we read the Bible, we see that most of the miracles were clustered around Moses and, and, and Aaron, Elijah and Elisha, and Jesus and his apostles. Uh, I'm not denying miracles can happen. Of course they can. And so if a person says to me, Brian, I had a supernatural encounter with God, you know, my, uh, to be honest, my uh, skeptical radars go up, and I want to ask the person what they mean. I'm not going to deny that you or anyone else has had that experience. I just will, will say that's not the, the normal course of action that, that God takes. He certainly can do that. Um, but I, if, even if that does happen, I don't think that that should be a regulative principle for our theology. And what I mean by that is even if, if someone's experience like yours are legitimate, and I'm not questioning that, um, that's great for the person who has the experience. We hear a lot of times that, that Muslims, for example, have, have dreams and visions of, of, of Christ. I'm not denying that at all. Um, but something subjective like that uh, cannot be used for me to change my theology. Right. Um, I would need something objective to run it on. So one thing that's different from Christ with Christianity post some other religion is that Christianity is objectively verifiable or falsifiable. We make historical claims, say this and such happened, these people mm. were eyewitnesses, and they can be verified or falsified. Claims from other religions, most other religions, don't make claims. that they're, And even Christians are, are afraid of making mm. these claims. It's one reason people are so scared of science and reason. Because if you go down that trail, you're opening yourself up to be shown false. And so that's the, the objectivity of Christianity. Well, we start getting into personal... God has, has done this in my life, even if that's true, that's wonderful, but that's, that's, not, that's not meant for me to be an objective game changer for my theology, if that makes sense. Is that kind of where you're wanting to go? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really great. And I've even uh, talked about that some with high schoolers when I teach them. I'll, I'll talk to them about Christianity being falsifiable, which sounds yeah. like a negative thing, but it's actually a right. good thing because... Right. Christianity wasn't, it's not based on some guy sitting under a tree and getting some kind of revelation and then drumming up a bunch of people to follow him and making a movement out of it. This is something that's actually grounded in historical facts and, uh, a, well, a resurrection event that either did or didn't happen in real history. And, and right. that, that is something that, that we need to think about because, you know, I, I was raised in the charismatic church, uh, that, that has, a lot of emphasis on experience. And although, like I said, I've had, probably when I look back, I probably have fewer that I would say I'm sure of than I would have said a few years ago. But at the end of the day, no matter what our subjective experiences are, uh, I might, this is, I mean, look at Joseph Smith getting new revelation. I was singing the exact same You know, it's like we were, have yeah. to compare everything that happens with, with the biblical truth and know that our subjective experiences aren't what defines what we believe about God. Right, right. So what are some dangers of Christians letting go of some of these sort of core doctrines to classical theism? What, what, what are some of the pitfalls that can happen when we start saying, ah, oh, maybe divine simplicity isn't so important. Maybe God's, uh, uh, you know, uh, being unchangeable isn't, isn't so important. Well, I guess there can be two types of, of dangers. One is doctrinal and one is practical. And so doctrinal is pretty obvious in that you're just, you're, you're going down a false road in terms of what you think God is. And to the extent that you're worshiping a, a God that you are describing differently than the true God, to some extent and to at some point you're worshiping a false God. 
And that might not be somebody who goes to church faithfully and thinks that God may be in time or changing, but at some point, at some, there's some demarcation. It might not be clear where that is, but at some point, you're worshiping a false god. So I think if you worship a god who, who has a physical body, that's a false god, right? Hmm. Now, Clark Pinnock is a perfect example of, of how this happened. He was a classical theist, started rejecting philosophy because it was he thought it was pagan, all this kind of stuff, and then started rejecting the classical notions of God and wanted to safeguard human free will. He thought if God knows what we're going to do perfectly, we can't have free will. So then we have to have to kind of limit God's ability to know. And then we start limiting God, making him less and less of the, of the classical classical God. And then he, he kept giving away more and more and more, which is easy to do when you start going down that road. And then uh, in his book, I think it's in The Most Moved Mover, he says that we need to rethink the notion of God being physical. You didn't say it in those exact words, but it almost was the exact words. Is that we need to rethink what it means and the possibility for God having a, a physical body. Just like the Mormons, just like the word faithers. And then we start getting into more objectively clear examples of, of being, you know, idol worshippers in a sense. And then there's more pastoral issues. You know, the issues like uh, the problem of evil come up, and we, 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 there are emotional and intellectual answers. If we start giving away the classical view of God, we're giving away our answer to the problem of evil. Because if, if God's not in complete control, like Harold Kushner says, a, a Jewish rabbi, his answer to the problem of evil is, well, God's not in complete control, so there's, that's why evil happens. Well, if we think God is in complete control— uh, then we have some answers to the problem of evil, like God is doing things for a purpose. He will. We don't see the whole picture, and he will ultimately bring all of this together for the good. We can't say that if he's not in complete control. Um, we – I lost my train of thought here for a second. We, we erode this, this kind of picture of God, and it loses the pastoral comfort – that we can we can understand with from a classical view of theism, and we just depart from the truth, and then we we lose. If you know, here's what I was going to say: if somebody comes to faith, and we say God is going to do this, or we give them some picture of God, like if you pray a prayer a certain way and God God should answer it, if we start making God into be a certain way, and then He's not, it can shake someone's faith. Right? And then we can unintentionally trip somebody up. So if you start think, saying things like, well, God is X, Y, and Z, but he's really not, and they come to think that he was X, Y, and Z, and then they discover that view was wrong, then – and there's some instances where a person's faith can be wrecked by, by these false doctrines, like with class, uh, by process theology, open theism, making God into, into being kind of like a man, being physical – um, and he's he we open the door more to, to theological disappointment, if that makes sense. It does, and what you're describing sort of reminds me of the Dake Bible. Are you familiar with the yeah. Dake Bible? I've I've been I've never read it, but I've been told what it says by one of our other professors, Richard Howell, and he yeah. Yeah, it's 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 like in an in an attempt to be pure in right. reading the word. Uh, and taking everything literally and, you know, again, like not using our reason to recognize figures of speech. Right. He ended up creating a God with a physical body and then almost ends up in this kind of polytheistic view of uh, like a tritheistic view of God uh, right. because of not wanting to be pagan. <laughs> but, it, but it ends yeah. up in heresy <laughs> because not using reason. So, right. uh, yeah, so that's good stuff. Well, if someone wants to learn more uh, about classical theism and some of these um, basic attributes of God, what's a good starting point uh, other than your blog? Definitely go to brianhuffling.com for more of this. But can you recommend a good book or a video to get people started? You already recommended Fazer's uh, Refutation of the New Atheist, which is a great book. What else can, can people look to? Right. The Last Superstition. Uh, I think a good book, a couple of them, one by Norman Geisler is um, – Making God is making God into the image of man. It's kind of a refutation of, of open theism. Uh, Brian Davies' introduction to philosophy of religion, third edition, uh, is very good, along with 
his other book on the thought of Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas is, is one of the epitomes of classical theism. Yes, he's Catholic. Um, he was Catholic before a lot of the, the Catholic pronouncements came out, like the Pope being infallible, these kind of things. Uh, but he does imbibe a, a very good and, and clear view of classical theism. So Brian Davies, one other book I was I was going to mention, and I'm sure I'll remember as soon as we're done with our podcast today. Um, <laughs> Geisler has a book on Aquinas as well. He does. Um, he has, I think the title has changed. I think it's Should Aquinas Be Forgot or something something along those lines. Well, good. Well, Brian, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. This was totally just, I love this stuff. So fascinating for me. So thanks for, for taking the time. Well, thank you. I appreciate having me on your, on your show. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you can sign up to receive my post by email by going to alisachilders.com and clicking the subscribe button, or simply subscribe to the Elisa Childers podcast on iTunes.